Oh, <laughs> lip gloss, yeah. Hello, my friends, on the saddest of days. It's the time of year when the general public seems to think that the time for watching horror movies is over, but here on this channel, you can rest assured that things will be spooky and things will be sexy 365 days a year. Yeah, this Halloween decor, it's not going anywhere. In fact, I got a new one yesterday. I got this little spider half off at Vons yesterday. It was like $3. You know what, let me introduce you. He really gives me like a Harold vibe. I think I'm gonna name him Harold or maybe Eugene. One of the two, vote down below. I also got a new plant, thanks for noticing. Look how pretty and spooky. Ow! Oh. <sighs> Dropped my fucking lip gloss. Where'd it go? What? Is there a vortex? It was on the chair. <laughs> anyway, because last month was October, I have a ton of horror movies to talk about today, naturally. But here's the structure of today's wrap up. First, I'll talk about all the TV shows that I watched this month. So of course that will include Chucky season two, Mike Flanagan's The Midnight Club, and Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. Then I'll talk non-horror movies. There's only two from this month, which would be Bros and The Tinder Swindler. After that will be all of my rewatches of horror movies, and this will include some very big franchises, of course. Next will be my new watches of old horror movies, and last month I finally got around to watching Death Becomes Her. And lastly will be new releases, which will fortunately make up the bulk of this video. As we all know, a little movie called Halloween Ends came out this month, yes. But also other things like Hocus Pocus 2, Terrifier 2, and many, many more. If you want to skip around, there will be timestamps linked down below, as always, if you just want to skip to the new release. But let's get cracking on all the TV shows that I watched this month. Chucky is back with a vengeance in season two and I'm so here for it. I was a little hesitant after the first episode. I didn't think it was the best, but after episode two, I'm fully on the hook again. I'm excited to see Glenn and Glenda. I really want to know what's going to end up happening to Nika. I also really want to see a lot more of Devin Sawa in his new role as the priest. It's hilarious that they brought him back in. I really hope that they just keep killing him off and then bringing him back as new characters each season because why not? It's so cheeky and self-aware and there's definitely an improvement in the acting from the first season. But I'll save the rest of my thoughts on season two because I will be doing a full review and a plot breakdown of it once it's all come out. So next up would be The Midnight Club. At a manor with a mysterious history, eight members of The Midnight Club meet each night at midnight to tell sinister stories and to look for signs of the supernatural from the beyond. I'm a little back and forth with this show because it wasn't quite everything I wanted it to be. I've kind of resigned my expectations for there to be good horror in Mike Flanagan's shows because he started to resort to the same tricks. So now I go into his shows expecting a drama with some light horror thrown in here and there. That made sense for Bly Manor, it made sense for Midnight Mass, and then obviously Haunting of Hill House was a bit more of a straightforward horror. It doesn't fit in super well in the Midnight Club, it feels kind of like ham-fisted. There are some stories that the kids tell that are so good. Example, episode two was my favorite episode of the entire show. It's hands down where the horror works the best, but it's still pretty subtle. And then sometimes the horror elements just feel straight up messy because it kind of opens up these plot threads that don't end up going anywhere. But this is the rare first case, I guess, where with one of Mike Flanagan's shows, he actually is trying to set up a season two. In the past, he's said that he never tries to set up a season two, and I would have preferred that for this show because it does not feel well contained. The biggest highlight of the show for me is Heather Langenkamp, who I've only ever seen play Nancy Thompson. I wasn't even even aware that she had chops outside of A Nightmare on Elm Street, but this is, I think, the best performance I've ever seen from her. I hope this kind of pulls her more into the mainstream and she starts booking bigger projects again. Same goes for actors like Barbara Crampton, who in the past has tweeted things like, uh, hey, don't forget about us older horror actors. She's right and she should say it. I loved seeing Heather in this show. She absolutely killed it. The younger actors are really hit or miss. I think the strongest one is definitely uh, the, the girl who plays Anya. But Flanagan is always exploring some form of trauma in his shows and with the Midnight Club I felt like that worked beautifully because they went through a lot of different avenues of terminal illnesses. It also had some really positive LGBTQ plus exposure regarding AIDS and I feel like this was kind of the informative and affirming show that a lot of people probably needed. So props to all that but my interest in the show had really petered out by the end which I'm bummed to say. I was super into it at first and you've probably been around you know I was telling everybody 
to watch it, but it didn't quite stick the landing. So anyway, we can move on. Up next would be Del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. This is an anthology of sinister stories told by various masters in their craft, hosted by none other than Guillermo Del Toro. I'll be honest, something is missing for me with this show and I can't really pinpoint what it is. I've enjoyed two out of the four and a half episodes that I've watched. Episode three gets really, really good about 35 minutes into the episode. And from that point on, my eyes were glued to the screen. And episode four, I enjoyed, even if it too was slightly lackluster, but that episode stars some of my faves. She's from one of my favorite shows, Raising Hope. And then he is obviously from Freaks and Geeks. So the second half of episode three was amazing. Episode four was, was decent. And then episode five, I have only made it halfway through because it didn't hold my interest. This is a show that I am gonna finish though because I trust Del Toro's taste. And if he's telling me that these are directors I need to keep my eye on, then that's what I'm gonna do. I also finished a show that I started last month called Little Demon. I spoke about it at length last month, so I'm not gonna read a synopsis, but Danny DeVito voices Satan. So what more do you need to know? It ended just as good as it began. I think that each episode is a really fun, wacky new adventure. And so, you know, I loved it. I loved the whole first season. So really not much to report on there. And then I also started a show last month called The Patient on Hulu starring Steve Carell. But that one, I just really feel no draw to go back to it and finish it. But I think I will because I'm, I'm kind of a completionist. So I guess I'll let you know next month if I do. But now we can move on to all of the non-horror movies that I watched. Up first, we have The Tinder Swindler. This popped off earlier this year and I just finally got around to seeing it. This documentary follows the story of women who were conned out of hundreds of thousands of dollars from a man they met on Tinder. I really enjoyed this documentary, can recommend completely. I'm not a fan of dramatic reenactments really with documentaries, but Netflix does that a lot. Luckily, there is so much actual evidence in this documentary. There are pictures, videos, audio, text messages, all the above. So they didn't need to do too much supplementing with dramatic reenactments. And my jaw was dropping constantly. The way this story unfolds and the ending rocked me. I obviously won't spoil it, but it got me worked up. Anyway, I know that we probably don't have many documentary heads on this channel, so I'll switch on to the next movie, which would be Bros. Bros is one of the gayest rom-coms you'll ever see, following Bobby as he goes from grinder user to helplessly in love. I wanted to like this movie so bad, and I'm really sorry to report that it sucks. It spends so much time making fun of Lifetime movies, so it kind of feels like a self-aware satire, and then it just goes ahead and follows all of those same old tropes. It's very confusing to me when movies do this. Oh, I'm a movie and I'm calling out the reasons why I am a bad movie. Also, the actor who plays the love interest has never done any movies really outside of Lifetime Christmas romance movies, and yet the romance in Bros is one of the driest things I've ever seen. Their whole meet cute, completely dry, no chemistry. Hey guys are so stupid. I know. But we've been smart enough to brand ourselves as being smart. It's our little secret. And then it never really gets better. They have this one kind of extended sex scene that I thought was really cute. It was one of the best parts of the movie. But beyond that, I'm like, y'all do not like each other. <laughs> it was also marketed as having really diverse representation. And then the more diverse characters spend maybe 10% of the movie on screen. I think if they really went in with another round of edits on this movie, then it could have been way better. As it is, it's so awkward. It's really lifeless and it is way too long. It's no wonder to me why this was a total box office flop because I think that plenty of people would have been down to go see a really good gay rom-com, but the word of mouth must have been pretty bad. Bad. But anyway, on to more enjoyable things. Let's talk about all the horror movies that I rewatched last month. If you've been around for my live streams, you know that I rewatched all the Chucky movies and all of the Halloween movies. There's plenty of content already on my channel concerning those franchises, so you can go find those playlists. The next movie I rewatched was Hocus Pocus to prepare for the long awaited sequel. I love this movie. It's just good, clean fun for the whole family. Except maybe that one part where a cat gets flattened on the road. Anyway, that group of women is hilarious. The 90s vibes are also so charming. I don't get tired of that movie. I have a really strong sense of nostalgia for it too, which is weird because I don't think I watched it until I was like 21. Anyway, Freaky is up next. I adore this movie. Catherine Newton is so badass playing both Millie and the Butcher. She and Vince Vaughn both just carry. Also the Blumhouse maze at Horror Nights was Freaky and the Black Phone themed and they killed it. They recreated the table saw scene, which is probably my favorite death in the movie. And then the second half of the maze was the Black Phone, which was terrifying. I don't know if it's because it was how Halloween, but the scare actors got really in our faces and the grabber character, oh, he's frightening. Anyway, they started to kind of tease a freaky Happy Death Day crossover movie. And I'm like, Christopher Landon, I am waiting. We are all waiting. But imagine how tired we are. 
Imagine how tired we are of it. Seriously, TikTok. Next, I rewatched another one of my all time favorite dark comedies, The Babysitter Killer Queen. It is the superior sequel to Netflix's iconic The Babysitter. I just recently gave a bunch of praise to Halloween Ends for being the first movie to flip the babysitter murders on its head when Netflix already did it five years ago. So I take that back. I retract that praise that I gave to Halloween Ends. Speaking of Halloween, my next rewatch would be Terrifier. And there is just something about this movie. And I'll tell you what it is it's Art the Clown. It's David Howard fucking Thornton. This man does things to me that I haven't felt in eons, which is giving me a genuine fright. He's so unbearably creepy. In this first movie alone, he cements himself as an icon. Argue with somebody else about that, not me, because I won't be having any of it. This man carried that movie. Also, shout out to that girl from The Bye Bye Man who also stars in Terrifier. Bit of an indie horror darling, me thinks. I, of course, watched this to prepare for Terrifier 2, which we will talk about very soon. But moving on, my only new watch of an old horror movie this month would be Death Becomes Her, which I don't even know if you'd fully classify as horror. If you've never seen this movie, it follows two women in a decades-long jealousy struggle who both learn the secret to eternal youth. This movie is so good. Why didn't anyone ever tell me? You've been keeping this and practical magic from me? What kind of people are you? Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn are so funny. Talk about comedic timing. I also had no idea that Bruce Willis was funny. I wish he became a comedian and not a cool guy action movie hero. Talk about a missed opportunity. This movie explores society's constant chase for youth, particularly by women. This movie has a more cynical take where the women come off as very egotistical. Rather than turning the camera towards the true instigators of this, which are male-owned beauty brands who create flaws about being old, one of them decided, hey, if we tell them that wrinkles are ugly, they're gonna buy this cream from us that tells them it'll keep their skin taut. Don't subscribe to the beauty trends from people who are trying to sell you something. Don't do that. Fun fact, episode four of of Cabinet of Curiosities kind of explores this exact thing that I'm talking about. You know how much money they make off all those creams and powders and lotions? All from making you think that there's something wrong with you. Something is wrong with me. If there's something wrong with you, well, there's something wrong with me too. You'll always be fine. You wanna know why? Because you're a man. Men can be fat and hairy and ugly and impolite and old and nobody cares. So when death becomes her, that kind of subject matter is not handled with the same care, but I let that slide because the way they do it is hilarious. Jessica Chastain has expressed interest in doing a remake with Anne Hathaway and sign me up for that. I'd be super interested to see how they would adapt the undertones of the movie to kind of modernize it. If you love a good ridiculous dark comedy, absolutely watch this movie. Also the set design, the costuming, it's all so decadent. It's just a great time. And you know what else is a great time? New original original horror releases, so let's talk about that. First up would be Mr. Harrigan's Phone, a new Netflix release. This follows a boy who grows up reading for Mr. Harrigan every week. After introducing Mr. Harrigan to the iPhone, he passes away, but somehow manages to send messages from beyond the grave. This sounds sick, right? It's actually such a bummer. I really like the first half of it, minus the decades-old bully trope that we see. Stephen King is really obsessed with depicting bullies in the exact same way in every single story he writes about children, but I really like the first half anyway because because of Donald Sutherland. He's so good at playing an old man. Like he just really goes for it, you know? Jaden Martell is also fine. The boy can act. What really interested me initially is that I think the movie takes place around 2008 or whenever the first iPhone was released and it explores the fundamental meaning of that. It started out as a pretty unique take on the old technology bad thing. However, it totally falls flat because there is no real climax or resolution of the film. It has nowhere to go, so it ends. I guess I can respect that. It's a crazy Crazy choice. It just seems like it's setting up something really big and then ultimately doesn't say anything new. I was expecting more given that cast. It's based on a Stephen King story, but alas. I don't recommend this one, especially to my audience, because the horror is so minimal. It really is a drama. So Sissy would be up next. This is an Australian Shudder original. This follows an influencer named Cecilia who runs into an old childhood best friend. She gets swept up into her bachelorette party plans and over the course of the weekend, horrifying truths from the past come to light. This movie was good and you should watch it. It's fun and self-aware and actually has something new to say. Influencer culture is something that really needs to be explored more in cinema. I eat up drama channel videos because the amount, the sheer amount of scammy practices and terrible people who have such big platforms, like we really need to talk about that more, I think on a cinematic level. Shudder is really ahead of the curve on this one. They have a lot of influencer-based movies, but not all of them are really great. Another one that I actually really liked would be Superhost, but it's not as focused 
focused on the influencers as it is on Airbnbs. Sissy begs the question, do you really know your favorite influencer the way you think you do? Because there are influencers who project themselves as being really vulnerable and really empathetic, but that's not who they are at all all off of screen. I feel like it's both a pretty explicit commentary on Shane Dawson and also on people who join multi-level marketing schemes knowing what they're joining. Because especially with those, there's like this facade of, of love and girl power. When it's like the meanest girls that you knew from high school who are joining and making the top rank. You see what I'm saying? So Sissy leans the fuck into that concept, but it's very self-aware and super entertaining. It's far from perfect. Sometimes Shutter Originals just kind of have something missing and Sissy is no different. But overall, it's really fun. I'd say iconic and I would definitely watch it again. Speaking of rewatchability, Hocus Pocus 2. Let's run that up. Hocus Pocus 2 follows a new group of witchy teens who accidentally reawaken the Sanderson sisters for another night of hijinks. This is, of course, the sequel to the 1993 cult classic Hocus Pocus turned true classic. I don't know what everyone expected from this movie. I got exactly what I wanted. The original is pure camp. The sequel is pure camp. They leaned more into the shenanigans of the Sanderson sisters having to deal with the modern world, something that in retrospect, I wish the original did more. Like one of them flies around on two Roombas. Two Roombas. The new main characters are also young up and coming witches, a perk that I didn't even ask for. It exceeded all my expectations, truly. It also matched the energy of the original to a T, but I feel like some of you guys are blinded by nostalgia saying that the vibes don't match. Literally, yes, they do. The Sanderson performances, the performances have not aged a day. They're exactly the same witches that we saw 30 years ago. You know what that is? That's talent. The main characters are a little bit dumb and annoying, but lovable all the same. And it's it's camp, what more do you want? If you couldn't tell, I'm a little bit passionate about this. I love it just as much as the original film. Wanna know what I didn't love as much as the original film? Not by a fucking mile. Halloween ends. I don't think you need a synopsis. I already did a full review of this movie. It's 40 minutes long surrounding all of the, you know, pop cultural mess and the movie itself and a plot breakdown. I'm also gonna be releasing a comparison to Halloween H2O very soon. So if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and do that and click the notification bell so you know when that video is live, especially because I'm also gonna be doing a comparison of Halloween 2 from 1981 to Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. This past season reinvigorated my fascination with that franchise, so we are extending the Halloween season. Anyway, up next would be My Best Friend's Exorcism. In 1988, best friends Abby and Gretchen navigate boys, pop culture, and a paranormal force clinging to Gretchen. With help from a mall exorcist, Abby is determined to compel the demon back to the pits of hell if it doesn't kill Gretchen first. This movie is just bad. I don't know what else I can say. The worst offense of this movie is definitely the attention humor. So, so let me, let me paint a little picture for you. They do the joke where it cuts to the main character sitting down to eat with the zany expert. So in this movie, the zany expert is the mall exorcist and he loves frozen yogurt. So the whole joke, which goes on for way too long, is just that he loves frozen yogurt. Elsie Fisher is just sitting across from him, looking at him like, and he's just slurping away and scraping at the bottom of his yogurt cup. That joke goes on for, I swear, I think like 20 seconds, just cutting back and forth. It's agony. In the scene before, there might have been a setup to it where she's like, can you help me? And he's like, do you like frozen yogurt? And then it cuts to that scene where he's eating it as if that's a punchline. I don't know why I couldn't think of any examples at the time of shooting this video, but it literally happens in Zathura. I think that's what I was thinking of. That's what this scene is. And then it also happens in 17 again. Like it's just a very common tired trope. I can't believe they did it again in 2022. That's just a little taste of the sheer mediocrity that you will experience watching that movie. I give it one and a half stars. It's very bad. It's pretty garbo. It's also just painfully generic. It's a story about two friends and one of them is moving away. So then they learn a lesson about friendship. And then it's also a very generic exorcism story. It's yet another 80s nostalgia piece. It's just not original in any way. On the flip side, Terrifier 2, let's talk about originality. Terrifier 2 follows Art the Clown after he's resurrected by a sinister entity. On Halloween night, he ends up finding a long line of fresh victims. Now this movie is gonna be perfect for the people that it's made for. It's not made for me as much as I wish it was, so take all of this with a grain of salt. Though it's a little bit hairy because I do really like the first movie, so it's interesting. Terrifier 2 was causing people to throw up and faint in theaters. Paramedics were called for some people, like the whole shebang. And after 
after seeing the movie, I get it now. For context, a little story about me. When I was a kid, I didn't understand what my anxiety was because I was never really given the language to express when I was feeling badly. So at age 11 or something, I had to get a blood test done and I fainted because I didn't really know how to express what was happening to me and it was lights out. Looking back to, I'm like, how did my mom and the nurse not recognize that I was having a panic attack? Like what? A panic attack so bad I fainted. I'm sorry, I'm getting lost in memory lane. So I don't handle gore all that well. That was the point of that story. But I've become desensitized and I can actually handle the first Terrifier pretty well. The second movie is vile. There's a nasty poop scene in the original movie and they expand upon that in the sequel. There's even more poop. That's kind of a line I've drawn because if you haven't been on my channel for a while, I've talked about this in the past, I have this recurring nightmare about public bathrooms. There are always variations of it, but the two main things that always happen are I end up in a public bathroom that's filthy and all of the stall walls are really, really low so you can just see everybody doing their business. Please don't psychoanalyze me in the comments. I'm just a strange girl. But basically, Terrifier 2 just had a lot of stuff that I couldn't handle very well. But for what it was, I still enjoyed most of it. The thing that was worse about it for me is that it's just way too long. I'm looking forward to the cut down version of it that they released to Screenbox, so I'll probably get back to you on that next month. I just don't have the ability to consume mindless content for longer than, uh, I don't know, like an hour and a half, and Terrifier 2 was two and a half hours long. It's a gorgeous film though. The set design is great. The costumes are great. Art the Clown, of course he carries. But I'm not really interested in the movie when he's not on screen though, because the rest of the characters just don't hold a candlestick to him. Except for one of Art the Clown's delusions, which is a new little thing in this movie. He hallucinates this little girl who kind of seems like his assistant maybe? In general, I guess it just wasn't really for me, but shout out to all the horror fans that got out to the theaters and saw this movie and gave it the success it rightfully deserves. I'll be in line for Terrifier 3, are you kidding me? Now, if you're somehow completely unaware of the Terrifier movies, I must qualify. <laughs> they are very, very bad, okay? They're not good movies, but not in the traditional sense. They do have this very distinct kind of low budget charm. And David Howard Thornton as Art the Clown, he deserves more than what he was paid. I can tell you that much. Speaking of things not getting their due, Significant Other was released to Paramount Plus last month. Significant Other follows a couple as they go camping in the Pacific Northwest when everything is not quite as it seems. Don't you dare watch a trailer. Don't you dare look up a more descriptive synopsis. Just watch this movie, especially if you like dark comedies, especially if you liked Barbarian or if you like Make a Monroe. This movie was great. Still a four out of five. Not amazing, but still great. It takes the same kind of twists and turns as Barbarian, and I really enjoy when a movie constantly pulls the rug out from under me. There are still genuine moments of real suspense, and I feel like they keep you engaged by confusing you, which kind of seems counterintuitive, but then it makes the reveals that much more satisfying. Because for a lot of it, you're like, huh? 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 And then it's like, Oh, people are sleeping on this movie, so let's wake that up. Don't get me wrong, I can understand why this movie wouldn't get a theatrical release. I don't think it'll be your favorite horror movie of the year, but it's a movie that's definitely worthy of your time, and I hope to rewatch it maybe in a couple years when I hopefully forget a few of the twists. Unfortunately, that's kind of the last great movie that I watched in October. Spirit Halloween, the movie, would be up next. Locked inside a store on Halloween night, three middle school friends encounter an angry spirit that possesses creepy animatronic characters characters. I don't have any thoughts on this one. One of the only positives is that Christopher Lloyd from Back to the Future is voicing this kooky ass villain. His consciousness transfers from different inanimate objects in this spirit Halloween store, which is kind of fun. Another positive is that it has really nice fall time vibes and it looks like they actually did shoot it in a spirit Halloween store. This is good and bad because on the one hand, it's cool that it's in a very accurate representation of a spirit Halloween store. I'd be willing to bet they actually did shoot in one. But on the other hand, you would think that they'd maybe beef it up a little bit more and give the store some even more spooky vibes because it's a movie. It doesn't have to be that realistic. I was rooting for this movie. I love shopping in Spirit Halloween and Hocus Pocus 2 also exceeded my expectations. So I was very much thinking, yes, campy kids Halloween movies are back. And this movie just didn't do that. Nothing much happens in this movie. It's boring. The kids are pretty insufferable. So I don't really recommend that one. And speaking of insufferable, Grim Cuddy is up next on the chopping block. A suburban teen girl and 
and her little brother must stop a terrifying internet meme brought to life by the hysteria of their parents. I think if you're like 12 years old, this movie is gonna slap. It's like the Bye Bye Man where it's completely insufferable, but I think it'll appeal to certain people for that very reason. I'm not above this kind of movie. I genuinely enjoy the Bye Bye Man, the Pee Pee Poo Poo Man. But maybe I've passed the age where I can be forgiving of new content that's this bad. With Spirit Halloween the movie as well, I feel like if I were a kid, maybe I would have loved it, but I'll never be able to know that for sure. But also, the original Hocus Pocus is campy and dumb, and same with Halloween Town, and I watch those as an older, you know, as an adult, and I still like them. But anyway, the creature design of Grim Cuddy is not that bad, I just think they made the mistake of showing it way too early and showing too much of it. From the very beginning of the movie, you just get full frontals of the monster, so you become quite desensitized to it. I don't know if this was done for the children who will undoubtedly make up the majority of this movie's audience, but it was not my cup of tea. So that brings us to Run Sweet heart run. After what begins as dinner with a client, a single mom finds herself hunted by a monstrous and seemingly unstoppable assailant. I really wanted to like this movie because I've been anticipating it for literally years. I explained this at length already over on Patreon, but if you guys haven't joined over there yet, okay, this movie put me through it. Years ago when I still watched trailers here and there, I saw a trailer for this film and then it disappeared off the face of the earth. I thought it was a fever dream. I thought I was losing my mind because the only thing that I remembered about the trailer is the part where she goes into his house and then he breaks the fourth wall and doesn't let us come inside. And then when that trailer disappeared and I never even learned the name of the movie, I was like, that's it early onset dementia. So now I think about three years later, it pops up randomly as an Amazon Prime release and my sanity is restored. Unluckily, the movie wasn't good, so let's discuss. I suppose back in the day, it was supposed to have a theatrical release because that's where I saw the trailer and then it got purchased by Amazon. And I guess Amazon funded some reshoots. I haven't really looked into that too far, but I have no idea what they changed or why. But the movie that we got as a result is this hollow girl boss flop. For the first hour or so, I think that you'll enjoy yourself with this one, but it then becomes abundantly clear that this movie has nothing new to offer you and it becomes insanely repetitive. There's a big twist that I feel like you can pretty much see coming from about a mile away, and I can't say what it is without spoiling it, but I feel like the twist kind of single-handedly detracts from the entire message of the movie. So to conclude, I feel like Hollow is the best way to describe the movie. Gatekeep, Gaslight, girl boss. am I right ladies? All right, let's talk about Wendell and Wilde. The two devious demon brothers, Wendell and Wilde, have to face their arch enemy with the help of the nun, Sister Heli, who is notorious for expelling demons. However, the brothers are not only plagued by her, but also by her altar boys. This synopsis that's given by Google is very inaccurate for some reason, but I couldn't even think of a better way to explain this movie. This movie has way too much going on, hence why I can't think of a better synopsis to supplement that. Basically, this movie has way too many characters that are competing to be the lead, and I'm not sure if the intention was to make a true ensemble. I don't think so, because the main character character definitely seems to be Kat, who has been sent away to, I guess it's like this school for deviants or something. Her parents had recently passed away, and so her whole arc is coming to terms with that, which was solid and I think could have been its own movie. But then Wendell and Wilde are also set up as main characters, whose main goal is to create an amusement park for departed souls. They're willing to do anything for it too, including tricking young girls who had lost both their parents. So their arc is about developing empathy for humanity which also could have been its own movie. But wait, I'm not finished. There's more. All of this is happening on top of what I guess is the main plot, where one of Kat's new friend's parents, they own this big prison and they've essentially like purchased this town. So they want to expand their giant prison. This main plot dives into the purely immoral practices of the prison industrial complex, also very much worthy of its own movie. I'm starting to see a trend where Jordan Peele crams so many ideas into his movies that they are completely competing so fiercely that none of them really have enough time to come up for air. This is also directed by Henry Selick, icon, who directed Coraline and The Nightmare Before Christmas, so sue me for thinking this storyline might be easy to follow. I guess you can give it to them that it is PG-13, so it's up to their own discretion to elevate the material's themes like that, but even as an adult, I don't know, it was kind of hard for me to follow. It's just like with Nope, where I felt like each subplot deserved to be its own film. Though it was still an absolutely stunning film and a wonder to look at, so it does have that going for it. But that's about it. It's also about an hour and 45 minutes long, which I think is just entirely too much. Especially because you know that children are still gonna watch it. It's animated and they're not gonna be able to follow it for shit. But I'm still happy it was made and I hope for more because adults deserve more animation like this. But anyway, we must finally now discuss 
else, pray for the devil. The Roman Catholic Church combats a global rise in demonic possessions by reopening schools to train priests to perform exorcisms. Although nuns are forbidden to perform this ritual, a professor recognizes Sister Anne's gifts and agrees to train her. Thrust onto the spiritual front line, she soon finds herself in a battle for the soul of a young girl who's possessed by the same demon that tormented her own mother years earlier. This movie was so bad, I cannot believe it is the last movie that I watched in October. To be fair, I did start Trick or Treat that night after watching that movie, but I didn't finish it, so I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one. Pray for the Devil is another fake girl boss kind of moment, and I'm not here for it. It's the most generic horror movie I've maybe ever seen. I was truly so baffled on Letterboxd, all I could say is, why would they make this? I could probably rattle about 20 movies off the top of my head that were way more deserving of a theatrical release. I don't know how in the hell they finessed that, and I don't know who in the hell it was made for. It has all the things. It has generic trauma exploration from a deceased abusive parent. It has over-the-top CGI scares where loud is scary. It basically has every last thing that you would expect from an exorcism story. This movie would have been outdated if it was released 10 years ago, let alone in 2022. It honest to God feels like a straight-to-DVD release from the early 2000s. It's bizarre. One might even say it's bonkers. Absolutely do not spend your money to go and see this movie. It's one of the only new releases this year that I gave a half star. It was that bad. The hold that the Catholic Church still has on some of these filmmakers, I swear to God. Another insane thing about the universe that this movie takes place in is that demonic possessions are as common as catching a cold, and it's apparently worth it to be setting up entire giant hospital schools to take care of all these patients who are getting possessed. Whoever made this movie deserves to be dragged. I'm not sorry. So with that, I think we can conclude my October wrap-up. Overall, it was an amazing month for me. I got to travel and partake in lots of fun, spooky activities. I had a great Halloween. I spent it at Horror Nights in Hollywood, so regardless of all the bad releases, I had a great month. I hope that you did too. Share any funny, tall tales from Halloween or any of the movies that you watched this month. And of course, a huge thank you to my patrons. I would not be here without you guys. If you'd like to get several bonus videos every month, then come join the Patreon. That'll be linked down below. If you'd like to hear me talk more at length about a lot of the movies that I discussed today, then you can watch kind of an uncut version of my reviews over on Patreon. It's not a different version of this video. Like, I film separate videos entirely. You get it. But if that's not for you, all the rest of my social media is down below. Make sure you're subscribed, click the notification bell, and the like. It helps me out a lot. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Make sure to keep the Halloween spirit alive, and I hope I catch you in the next one. Bye!